Welcome to this week's episode of Startup for the Rest of Us. This is episode 520, in which I have a lovely conversation with Keith Perhack, the founder of Segmetrics. Segmetrics allows you to get 100% clarity on where your leads come from, how they act, and how much your marketing is really worth. We dive into exactly the difference between Segmetrics and other options for attributing sales and and revenue to traffic channels and advertising channels and all that. And we go through Keith's background. You may have heard of him. He's done at least one microconf attendee talk. He's done a microconf main stage talk. He used to host a podcast with Patio 11. And Keith and I cover some really interesting ground today as he talks about why he shut down his million dollar marketing agency to, you know, build and double down on his SaaS. But before we dive into that, I wanted to ask you a favor. If you've been listening to the Tiny Seed Tales episodes that are coming out on Thursday mornings, you have heard through episode seven that came out last week. There are two episodes left, obviously this Thursday and next Thursday. I'm curious to get your feedback on season two and frankly, just the whole concept of Tiny Seed Tales. Feel free to email me directly, questions at startupsfortherestofus.com. You can DM me on Twitter or you can at mention me at Rob Walling on Twitter. Given the amount of time and money that they cost to produce, I am curious to hear if you like the storytelling approach. Obviously, it's a more produced form than really exists in our space and I enjoy doing them, but I also want to make sure that they're providing some type of value to you, whether it's entertainment, motivation, inspiration, tactics, just anything that you're getting out of it, I would appreciate hearing from you. So drop me a line and let me know what you think. And with that, let's dive right into our conversation. Keith Perhack, thank you so much for joining me on the show today. Thanks so much for having me, Rob. So today we're here to talk about why a multi-million dollar agency owner decided to quit it all and move to SaaS. It's a great topic. It is. It is. It it sounds a lot more (laughs) impressive when you say it. (laughs) Why in the world would you do that, sir? No, we're going to dig into that today. So just so folks have some context, you're a software developer turned marketer and the dangerous combination. I love that combination. Whether it's a marketer who learns how to code or a developer who learns how to market. It's, it's like a superpower. It really, really is. And I don't think people understand that enough. You know, because a lot of us developers, like you do it for five years, you do it for seven years, you become senior and you're like, man, I can build a lot of things. And then you start over with marketing and it's a grind and you don't know any of it and you think it's fluff. You get three, four, five years into that and you pile those two on and it's like, it's ridiculous. It's like an epic high level multi-class in Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, just to be able to understand how the internet and all that technology works makes you such a better marketer. People come to us and they're like, well, why aren't these things tracking right? And it's like, because you have no idea of how the internet works and why the scripts aren't firing and how URLs even work, right? So once you understand that, it, it's a superpower to get everything. And that's not even touching like the automation you can do. And yeah, it's it's crazy. Yeah. And so you were running a seven-figure marketing agency. It was called Develop Your Marketing, focused on conversion rate optimization and building out funnels. You had marquee clients, big name clients folks have likely heard of, like Ramit Sethi and Eben Pagan. And you decided to build a SaaS on the side, or I think you were using the same resources, right? You were kind of using the agency team to to start building that out. And that SaaS is called Segmetrics, segmetrics segmetrics.io. I'm going to read a little bit about it so folks have a context of what you built. And then we're going to go back and kind of talk through your decision to build it, the highs and lows, you know, launching and just the whole story so folks can both be inspired by it, also feel the agony and the pain of what you felt in the early days and and as well as take away, you know, actionable stuff. Because obviously your story as a marketer, developer, um, I think there's going to be a lot folks can take away. So Segmetrics, that your H1 is get clarity on your true lead value every step of the way. But the subtitle there is get 100% clarity on where your leads come from, how they act, and how much your marketing is really worth. Get a handle on the key performance indicators that matter most for your marketing funnels built by marketers for marketers. So when I think of analytics or attribution, I think of, okay, I have have Google Analytics as this anonymous analytics, right? And aggregated. I have mixed panel or there's obviously, you know, those types of competitors for like individual funnels and people walking through. And then of course I have Facebook pixels and Google pixels and other things for kind of conversions and dollar amounts. And I I think mixed panel does that too, but where does Segmetrics fit into that mix? 
So the idea is kind of similar to Mixpanel in a way, which is we want to be able to see everything that anyone does in a customer journey from what ad they landed on to how many times they viewed a page to if they attended a webinar to be able to understand who are the most valuable people who are going through your marketing fund. Now, the problem with Mixpanel is that it has no native integrations and it has no idea of revenue out of the box. So it has a garbage in garbage out problem where unless you are really diligent about what data you're sending into Mixpanel, you are not going to get anything valuable out of it, right? And so what Psychmetrics does is we took that idea of like, okay, we want to see every event in an entire customer journey, but marketers are never going to be able to hook this up. So what we need to do is integrate directly with all these tools to pull the data out of Google Analytics, out of Google Ads, Facebook Ads, your ESP, your CRM, your Stripe, your payment gateways, everything, and create an individual persona that we can then say, this is this person from all these different sources brought together, and this is their full customer journey. Because then what we're able to do is say, all right, we know that Facebook ads we're getting, let's say, our lead value is $50 for each lead we bring in from Facebook. But within that, do we have actions that make people worth more money or worth less money? Are there certain demographics that can make people more valuable or less value? So it's this idea of finding the segments of actions or demographics or people that are more valuable so you can then go after them more and to be able to market to them better and to understand your audience better. Yeah, okay, that makes that makes a lot of sense. I mean, it was certainly an issue that that I've had marketing SaaS as we were doing ad spend or even getting organic traffic of, I had these aggregate numbers of, hey, this is what our churn is, for example, but I, I couldn't slice it based on demographics or oftentimes even based on source unless I, you really have to finagle some stuff. And that's why we built it because as a conversion rate optimization agency, that's what we were doing. We exported all this data from all these tools, created a bunch of pivot tables, and five hours later we had information. Yeah, and so... Inside Segmetrics, you can slice and dice it and you could look at churn, you could look at lifetime value based on all this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. Okay, for me that paints a crystal clear picture. And I think most SaaS founders who have who've gotten this far, you know, who are doing 5 or 10K a month or more and are trying to attribute stuff know the limitations of having to build it custom. So we may have already answered my first question then, because the first question is why build why build a SaaS company for running this seven-figure agency? But it's it's obvious that over and over and over, you probably had to cobble this together with duct tape and bailing wire. Yeah, essentially, we were working with a, a analytics agency or agency, a friend who did a lot of our analytics. We had a lot of our analytics done in-house and we just spent so much time on it. We were spending probably 20, 30 percent of our week just pulling the numbers. That doesn't even mean the analysis of what they're doing, but just pulling these numbers. Because you figure, let's say we're looking at, OK, we have this webinar. What is the lead value of someone who attends the webinar? OK, we pull all that data from whatever system we have. Then we pull it from all the tags and then we pull all the revenue and then we match them together, blah, blah, blah. Awesome. And then we, t we write up the report, the PDF, the everything. We, we take it to the client and they're like, well, what about people who came from organic versus paid? What's that breakdown look like? It's like, give us five more hours because <laughs> we got to go do that whole thing all over again with these new th things. And the analytics guy that we're talking to and the guy on my team, we were talking about this and it's like, it's just a database. It's just a spreadsheet. Why can we not just slurp this data in and do this automatically? And so that's where it kind of starts. like, okay. Could we do this? Could we scratch our own itch? And yeah, and that's where it kind of started from. And today you are a team of 10. And as you said, offline growing very quickly. I'll put that in quotes. And of course, I, I have your revenue graph here. You're in batch two of tiny seeds. So, you know, I have access to your numbers, but I will confirm that doing very well. And in fact, your growth has accelerated. L really looks like, yeah, it's April, May, it starts kicking up, which coincidentally. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, wonder, I wonder what happened in April and May of this year. I have no idea. Yeah, I have no idea. I don't think batch two started. So we'll, we'll get into that later in the interview because I want to do some something chronological. But you started working on this five years ago, back in 2015. And you told me that you built it in two weeks, two to three weeks, and that you had a customer the first week of launch. That sounds amazing. That A, that is crazy, crazy fast to build a tool that fast. And second, to get your first customer first week of launch. Both of those things, how did those happen? 
So this is actually the second SaaS I've built. So the first one was Summit Evergreen, which was a, a membership site platform for, again, for marketers, for info marketers. And we had made some mistakes that time that we took, we thought we knew what the customers wanted based on the consulting we had done. We built a very large, very complicated app that had a lot of features that it turned out that no one actually needed. It took us many months to get to market. Once we got to market, it was a slog to get people in. It was very difficult. So with this, we built it to scratch our own itch, but at the same time, we were like, this is something that everyone needs, but we're not going to make the same mistake. So what we did was we did a very hands-on iterative process with our customers, and we picked two or three customer clients that we were working with, and we said, hey, we're building this thing. Here's the numbers that we're looking to get. Is this valuable? Yes, no. They would respond. We'd say, awesome. We did a raw dump of their data. We plugged it into the engine. There's no UI. There's no nothing at this point. There's just me doing some math in a PHP file on the back end based off of a CSV, right? And we get that in and we spit that out and we show it to the clients and we say, hey, for this webinar you just ran last week, this is the, the lead value. And they're like, oh my God, this is amazing. And we're like, okay, this, this probably has something. So then we had... The team had a little bit of downtime. I think this was early February or late January, right after a big launch. We knew we had two weeks of almost no client work. And so we decided, let's put a challenge to ourselves. Let's get the team together, and we are going to work on this full time for two weeks. We're not going to do any client work because we don't have much scheduled. And we are going to see how much of this we can build. And in two weeks, we pretty much had version one done. The engine was already built, but the UI, the sign up, everything around it, the the creating the reports, the spitting out the reports, the graphs, the, the everything we built in, in about two weeks. Funnily, we launched and it got on Product Hunt the day we launched. I'm super excited about that. And then I found out that there was a space in our um, Stripe public key when I had copy pasted into the site. Oh, no. Yeah, so no one was able to purchase. That was, that was rough, but... It didn't deter us, and uh, I think within a month, we were up to 1,000 MRR. Wow, that's great. So A, I mean, a lot of learnings from that. I think people think of an MVP as a, you know, a limited version of the product, but I mean, you really tripled down on that, that definition. It was a text file. I actually have screenshots uh, of me in Slack, or not Slack, it was Skype, and I just had a text file with like six lines, and I just copy-pasted that in. And I was like, is this valuable? They're like, yes. That's it. That was it? Uh, yeah. I, well, I love that approach. And I often talk about, like in my first book, I talk about human automation of having VAs just do something on the back end and spit out a report. And that's really, in essence, kind of what you did there. So first customer, first week launch, you obviously solved a problem. 1K MRR in the first month. Were you getting those leads from clients or were you actually doing marketing? I don't remember, to be honest. I know we had two clients that had decided to sign up as customers. A number of our of our clients we kept as just kind of free using it because they weren't interested in the numbers, but we needed it for our work, so we did it internally. And then the rest were people who found us either through Product Hunt or promotions that we did, tweets. But honestly, five years ago, I don't really remember who they were or where they came from. Right, and you mentioned to me, as we were talking before the interview, that you were at about 1K MRR after the first six months. Is that right? I mean, did growth plateau that much? <laughs> yes. We didn't hit 2K until August of 2016. Oof. So that was more than a year later because this was early 2015. So what happened then? You see, you basically rocket to 1K MRR. You've, you've solved a problem that people is obviously a dire pain point, And then you flatline, in essence, for a year. What happened there? Oh, more than a year. More than a year, Rob. <laughs> you, you remember every minute of that 15 months, don't you? Uh. So what happened was that I had a day job, right? And not a day job like I was working for someone else, but we had the agency. And the agency is pulling in, like you said, a million plus a year. And it's really hard to take the team off of client work and put them on something that's making $1,000. Like we, we didn't have any customers that, or any clients that would pay us $1,000, like just $1,000. It was, that was inconceivable, right? I think our lowest contract was 10K a month. So it was very difficult for us to put the time into it. 
And I think we languished there, I'm looking at the graph, until 2000, mid-2018. And wow, you can actually see the spike. Okay, so mid-2018, I had decided that we were going to focus on Sigmetrics. And this came from, we had always said, hey, you know, we're always the bridesmaid, never the bride. We're helping our clients run these million dollar launches, multi-million dollar launches. We're making good money, but we want something that we control and our product and our stuff. And we had always thought this and we had Sigmetrics there, but we had never put any love and any energy into it. And so that summer, I remember I spent some time, we rewrote the UI and I said, we're going to focus on this. Over the next six months, we're going to transition out of consulting work, out of the agency work, and we're going to start moving towards Segmetrics and something that we own. And I know it's going to be slow because we make a lot from the agency and we need to wind that down slowly, but that's our goal. And that was kind of the, I was just tired and I think the, the team was just tired of having this great resource that no one was using because we didn't spend the time to make it worth it, to, to put it out there. I remember having that same issue before I went full-time on products and I was consulting. I had a basically a micro agency where it was either me or me and a few contractors that I, you know, marked up and, and built out. It was software development. And I remember billing whatever it was, 125 an hour, 115 an hour, somewhere in that range for every hour. And I was booked more than full-time, you know, 40 plus hours a week I could work. And I had these products on the side that were doing exactly that. I had a beach towel website that was doing like a thousand dollars a month, but it was making, you know, net profit was $150 a month. And I had .NET invoice, you know, which was doing a couple grand a month, most of that profit. But when you compare those numbers, it's like, well, I can make a couple grand in like two days of work. And it, it was such the struggle. And I've heard people call it like the, it's an addiction, right? The cash agency work or, or consulting is this cash addiction. And it's amazing when you want to get to full-time income or hire quickly, but it's really hard to move away from. Because as you said, the focus is constantly towards your high value, instant cash infusion, which of course is working for clients. And so it sounds like you just, you got tired of it, you got fed up with it, and you wanted to double down on something that, that you had built. You fired your whole team in order to do this in late December 2018. And that must have been brutal. Oh, so it was rough. It was honestly rough. And it wasn't a, hey, I decided to work on Psychmetrics and I'm letting everyone go. The original plan was bring everyone over and we're going to slowly shift over and the team's going to stay. And there were a number of issues with that. So one of them was that same mental model that the company has of, hey, I can do work for clients and make a lot of money, or I can spend time and make no money with this ass, was also there with the employees, with, with my team. And we actually had a number of conversations of this over six months, but essentially what it came down to is it was too hard of a mental shift to go from the client is asking for something right now. I could spend an hour on that and the company makes X hundred dollars, or I can spend six hours working on psych metrics and the company makes Bob kiss because there's not a one-to-one -one translation. I mean, at this point, I think we had done the agency for six years, eight years maybe. And that was the challenge, which was we have a, an hour for dollar time for money exchange with our clients right now. We do not have that with Sigmetrics. We have a time for literally nothing exchange. And it was very hard for not only myself, but the team to prioritize that. And then, the, I mean, there were also other issues like, you know, when you only have less than 100 customers, you don't need an account manager, right? So where do we take the account manager? And so I kept trying to find roles that didn't fit for people. And it was just, it was just very difficult. And what I ended up doing at the end of 2018 was saying, hey, guys, you guys all you guys are in charge of Segmetrics. You guys work on Segmetrics. I'm going to handle all the client stuff so it gets it all off your plate. And the mistake I made was thinking that they understood Segmetrics as well as I did because I had been living it for, for a year at that point, right? Mentally trying to think of like, okay, what are we doing next? What are we doing next? And it was just, it was a mistake on my part and it was just a shift that couldn't happen. So what happened in January, I said, hey guys, we can't do this anymore. 
I helped find them new work, introducing the clients. And honestly, it was hard bringing. I've, I'd worked with these guys for, God, six, seven years. It was really rough. And the good side of it, kind of the win side of it, is that because Segmetrics has been growing and because there's very little of the agency side left, I've actually brought them back on in the last few months. And so I've kind of brought the team back together and they're now working in roles that I think run to their strengths instead of the, the things I was trying to force them into, which is really wonderful because I loved working with them and I'm glad that they're back uh, on the team. That's a, such a cool ending to that story. You know, when you're in the midst of that, it probably feels devastating. And yet to circle back two years later and be like, hey, we have a product now that can afford all of us, you know, that makes the salaries like that's, that's an incredible story. That's, that's cool. So as you've contacted people, I'm assuming you've been kind of bringing them on, you know, one at a time and you email them and like, hey, want to come back and work on Segmetrics? Are, are they just stoked? Are they like over the moon to do it? I don't know. Like, yes, yes, they, they were. But it was, I was always very nervous about the whole thing because you know, I let them go. Like I, I felt like I had failed them in some way. And it was very nervous for me to reach out and to talk about that and to, to bring them back on. But we, you know, we had talked in the interim, like it's not like I had cut them out of my life completely. So I, I hope there's no ill will, but I, I enjoy having them back on. Mentally and emotionally, it was a very rough time, I guess. Well, I imagine it seems to me if I were in your shoes, like it would almost be a mix because you have to let these folks go. You've been working with them. At the same time, once that's done, you were then full-time on Segmetrics, focused, right? By January of, of 19, so just a month or two later, you were a bit, essentially, for the first time since you had launched it, you were all in on it. And that had to have felt good. It felt good. It felt very good. It did come with some challenges, though, because there's this thing, when there's other people around, there's blame to go around, Right. I, I see this a lot with the with my family as well. It's like, oh, it's noisy in here. I can't concentrate or the kids kept me up last night. I can't get my work done. And then when it's just you, all those excuses go out the window and you're like, well, crap. The reason I'm not being productive, the reason I'm not focusing on what I should be doing is not some external force on me. It's because I'm an F up. Right. And I need to get my I need to get in gear and get my mental state in sync so that I can do my work and focus on the things that are important. Yeah, it's such an interesting thing. You know, you mentioned to me offline that your family actually left for six weeks and you weren't able to go with them. They went to Japan where you guys used to live. And so you were left alone at the house. And probably you're in a monologue is finally <laughs> all the interruptions are going to stop. Oh, I was so it's gonna excited. It's going to be so quiet. I'm going to get so much done. And that's not what happened. No, like first two days, I think were great. And then after that, it's like I just had to start wrestling with the with my own existence at that point. And like, why am I not being productive? Because I remember back when I was younger and I could pull those 14 hour days and it was great. And I felt energized by that. And now I'm I'm almost 40 or I'm be 40 this year and I don't have that same energy. Right. And there's a lot of mental stuff that kind of went around that. And I had to understand what are the things that make me productive? What are the things that don't make me productive? And how can I get rid of the things that don't make me productive? Yeah, so much about learning your own psychology and managing that, right? And learning yourself. Same thing for me. When I was in my 20s, I could I could do 12 hour days plus sometimes 14 hour days, especially, I mean, there was a point where Sherry went to Africa for a month, I believe. And during that time, I would come home from the day job and then I would like kick on a season of friends and I'd, you know, make dinner and just sit in front of the couch and code. And I was coding side projects. And this is, you know, 18 years ago or something. And man, I, I got so much done. And I would, I would basically work from five or six at night until probably about one or two in the morning. And then I'd get up the next day and go to the day job. And it was kind of exhilarating because I was building my own thing. And within a month, she came back and I had launched a product. And I believe that was like probably feed shot. It was like a really early one that I did that crashed and burned. But 
during that time, I also learned, she came back and I started talking about Ross and Rachel as if they were like my friends. I was like, oh yeah, Ross was saying that the other day. And she's like, you know, they're not real, right? You know <laughs> that they're not real people, right? So uh, that's always been a funny joke. But yeah, it's it's learning about your own psychology. And, you know, obviously in my 30s and, and now early 40s, you have to know more about yourself, I think. Or at least I've had to learn more about myself and my ability to make myself focus, right? And make myself get stuff done. And it sounds like you've gone through the same thing, but at the beginning of 2020, just what is, you know, whatever, eight, nine months ago, you hired a project manager to manage you, to, to basically bust your chops. Like, tell me about that because it's pretty smart. I mean, I know some people get like executive coaches or, you know, business coaches who maybe they meet with once a week or twice a month or something, but you hired someone who's more in the business and almost like, are they driving tasks? Are they keeping you accountable? Yeah, so we, even before I really had the team back, we were creating essentially quarterly goals. We were creating, okay, this is what we're going to be working on this month. And it gave me really two things. One, it kept me on task. So if I went off rails too many times, like, sure, you have something come up, whatever. But she kept me on. I was like, hey, you know, if you don't start on this stuff, we're not going to finish it by the end of the month. We're not going to finish it by the end of the quarter. These are the things that you said were important. That was one thing that was highly valuable to me because I default to coding. I don't default to launching or to marketing or any of that. I default to sitting and building out new features because that's what I enjoy doing. But that's not going to move the product. And so she was very good at keeping me on what needed to be done for the business. The second part of that, which I thought was just as valuable, was that at the end of the month and the end of the quarter, she's like, here's all the things you got done. And it was mind blowing because I'm one of those people who no matter how much I get done, it never feels like I got anything done, right? Like I feel like I'm constantly busy, but I'm not getting enough done in the time. And so to have her come and we go back over the last month or the last quarter and say, we got 80% of the, the key tasks you said that you were going to get done. You have all these other like small things that came up during the month that maybe didn't get done, but the key things you said need to get done this month got done. And that was just, that was amazing. It, it was empowering to me. Yeah, that sounds incredibly, just uh, the accountability alone. To, and that's knowing yourself, right? You learned, hey, I need someone, you know, an external. It's like folks, some folks I know, they can go to a gym and they want to do it on their own or they get equipment at home and want to work out in their own garage and prefer not to be in the social setting. And other folks want a trainer so that they have to show up this many days a week and get their chops busted. So I think that's kind of a cool a cool hack. I, again, I've heard other folks hiring, you know, whatever CEO coaches or executive coaches, but this was a little different take on that that I, I thought was interesting. Do you remember, it was actually Manish Seti who hired someone off of Craigslist to slap him each time that he uh, looked at Reddit or anything like that. Oh, geez. So wow. he did a whole blog post about this, but essentially he hired someone to sit next to him. And every time he goofed off, like looked at Facebook or something, she just slapped him. And now... <laughs> That's an interesting, <laughs> it's like a stunt. It, that's like a reality TV stunt or something totally I would see is, in but, office space, yeah. But that is the, that's the value that having my project manager gives me, right? She's not physically slapping me, but that's the value that I'm getting out of it of like, hey, stay on task, you got stuff to do. All right. And so it sounds like you've kind of, you know, hacked your own psychology a bit, you know, with this project manager and have kind of fixed that kind of weakness, I guess, for now. So changing it up, switching gears a little bit, you had talked about, and I saw it in the Tiny Seed Slack, that one, one of the low points of your year was earlier this year, and it was a technical snafu with the database. And I know I, I'm going to make you relive this because we've all been there. You just have to tell this story, man. It's, it's going to be painful. Do it once. We'll get it on tape. So databases, oh, they are my, uh, they are my kryptonite, I guess. So what, what happened was that there's something in MySQL 5.7 or whatever you're using that made the database fill up in about an hour. So we went from 30% full to completely full in an hour. And of course, if it's full, it's not going to write new data. So we're effed up there and trying to figure this out and freaking out. And there's no way to compact it down because of a, I think it's like a 12 year bug in MySQL. And so I finally gave up and said, okay, we're just going to export the database, create a brand new one, do it over. So we did it. All right. All right. We're safe. Cool. 
Two weeks later, the exact same thing happens. We go from 30, and this has taken a week of my life at this point, just to migrate this thing and do it and make sure everything's done and this whole thing. And then we have to do it again. And I finally say, I can't do this anymore. And we move to a managed hosted solution through uh, DigitalOcean, who's our provider. So they have a hosted database set up. And so we migrate everything over there. And I'm like, finally, we're good. All the tests run, perfect. I go to sleep. I wake up to my phone buzzing again, and I'm like, oh my God, what now? And apparently there are some setting differences between how they have it set up and normal MySQL that was causing a bunch of imports to fail. And all of our tests ran. So I think it was four weeks or maybe six weeks of just screaming constantly about this database issue and throughput issues and speed issues on Oh, it's just miserable. Just absolutely miserable. I, Yeah, I don't know what people are supposed to take out of this because it was just painful. But the thing that I took out of this was that the reason I was running the local database in the first place, so not the managed one, is because it was a fourth of the cost. And I was like, I can do this better. I can have it customized. And I'm going to be paying a lot less. And that was great until the database exploded and then exploded again. And I lost four to six weeks of productivity because I didn't want to pay, I don't know what it was, maybe $100, $300 extra, $200 extra, whatever it was per month for a managed solution. Man, as, as a bootstrapper, I would have done the same thing. It can be obvious in retrospect of like, oh, I just should have paid the few hundred dollars because it made sense. But there are so many decisions you have to make as as you're growing and you can't always do the Mercedes. And you can't throw money at all of them. No. There's just too you, many. That's That was a big difference once we sold Drip to lead pages is that you could just throw money at it because they had raised <laughs> 38 million in venture. And I remember having conversations in, there'd be strategic conversations with kind of senior leadership. And I'd be like, man, that's going to be tough. And they're like, well, what does it require? And I was like, well, I mean, we could just throw a bunch of servers at it. It's going to be expensive. How expensive? For this event over weekend or whatever, I'm like, I don't, you know, like five 5,000 bucks and they laugh. And they're like, bro, this is not even worth the conversation. Like we just wasted that much in dollars, you know? And so it was a, it was a nice luxury of having, obviously we weren't flippant with money and you shouldn't be and, and all that stuff. And frugality has its own rewards, but in the sense of, of having your database managed, I think there's just, there's a lot of value there if, if you can swing it. Yeah. It's, you know, it's the, the core things of your business. Like if this goes down, what is the impact to the business? And what's the chance of it going down if someone else is managing it versus yourself? And... I don't think doing a managed server from the beginning was the right move, but once we started having issues, we should have really looked at it instead of trying to do multiple migrations to other self-hosted stuff. Yeah, I think that makes sense. And so as we kind of transition to closing, as we're getting to time, I did want to dig in, you know, we teased it at the at the top of the show that your growth has really accelerated since April of this year. So just over the past five months, there's a real noticeable uptick in, in your revenue graph. I, of course, like to attribute that to you starting Tiny Seeded. But I, I am curious, you know, what have you done differently? We obviously, you know, at Tiny Seed, one of the early things we talk about is pricing. A lot of folks have, you know, a lot of us SaaS founders just don't have pricing dialed in, whether the value metrics off or whether it's too low. You tweaked with your pricing. I'm curious if that had an impact or what else? So I think that there were two main events in Segmetric's five-year life that moved the needle. One was focusing on it full-time, and there's a big jump in revenue starting when I decided to focus on it. The second one was Tiny Seed, and the jump from Tiny Seed is much bigger <laughs> than the first one. But the way we changed pricing, I think, had a, had a lot to do with it, because what we had originally with our pricing model was essentially large buckets. So you were in the starter bucket until you hit 50,000 contacts. As soon as you had 50,000 and one, you had to pay $100 extra. And it was difficult because people tried to keep their, their contacts low and people tried to, people would always email us and it's like, hey, I'm only one over. Can I have a have it cheaper for now? And it's like, yeah, sure, fine. It's just one. And people, the upgrade process was manual and there's always stress around. It's this whole thing. The pricing is actually pretty similar. I think for the majority of people, they're paying around the same amount. But what we changed was that pricing is now increasing based on the number of contacts you have, but only $5 at a time. So the big difference is now not that you are 
going to hit a wall and suddenly be paying twice as much, you're going, it's like boiling a frog, right? You're slowly going up as you get more profitable. And as you succeed in your business, you're going to pay us just a little bit more. And that I think has made it much easier for people to do that upgrade because people really don't care about an extra $5 a month, but they do care as soon as they hit that threshold of, okay, now your bill has doubled. That's the thing with pricing is it's, you didn't really change your pricing. You kind of just change how it auto adjusts, you know, and that's, it's one of these things that is a challenge to foresee if it's going to make a difference. But I think there's a lesson folks can take away is if you do have these big gaps, maybe have, maybe have smaller tiers in between the published tiers. You know, we did this as well with drip back in the day where we would go up based on subscriber count and having, having it go up every thousand subscribers or every 2000 subscribers versus every 10 or 20, like we originally did, it did make a difference for us. I don't know. It's, it's almost closer to metered pricing. It's not exactly like me. True metered would be like five cents per subscriber, you know, or for you, it'd be, you know, absolutely per contact. And you're not doing that. It's still in small tiers, but I do think there's, there's value in, in thinking about that. Yeah. And the other part of it, I think that was the biggest one, but also just deciding what integrations and this is kind of the Zapier model of, okay, if you're using HubSpot, you're not going to be a hobby user. Right. So you're going your base price is going to be higher. So you have to start out at a higher tier if you are higher level because they require more support. They require more effort. And we're dealing with bigger companies. So that that I think also helped a lot where everyone before it was just contact based and now it's contact plus features. Well, sir, thanks again for joining me on the show. If folks want to keep up with Segmetrics on Twitter, it's at Segmetrics, obviously Segmetrics.io. And you, let me see if I can pronounce it right this time. Is it Harrisenbon? That's close enough. <laughs> yeah. How would you pronounce your Twitter handle? Uh, Hadi Senbon. Hadi Senbon. Yeah, 79. So we'll link it up because it's kind of hard to spell, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so bad at naming. I can't believe I ever got into programming. Is really what it comes down to. <laughs> uh, what are the, the two hardest problems in, uh, in programming are naming, cache invalidation, and off by one and errors. Off by one errors. Yep. Yeah, boom. You did a joke. Oh, no, you've heard me tell that. I love that joke. I love that joke. Uh, well, sir, thanks again for joining me on the show. Hope you had fun today. I did, Rob. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Keith Perhack. If you have not headed to startupsfortherestofus.com and entered your email address to receive the two exclusive episodes and PDF guides, I would encourage you to do that. First one is called Eight Things You Must Know When Launching Your SaaS. Second is 10 Things You Should Know As You Scale Your SaaS. And these are two podcast episodes. They're Rob Solo Adventures, where I run through eight things and 10 things respectively that I think you should know as you launch and then as you scale a SaaS app. And these are things that I have not released on the podcast and they're not on my blog and really not available anywhere else. So check it out, startupsfortherestofus.com and you can check out the right message pop up in the lower right or really go to any page and opt in on the right hand side to join thousands of other startup founders who are bootstrapping and mostly bootstrapping ambitious SaaS apps. So that's it for this week. I will talk to you again Thursday morning on Tiny Seed Tales Season 2 Episode 8. And I will be here in your earbuds again next Tuesday morning.